Well, you have a treat in store. Uh, our guest preacher today is Reverend Glenna Shepherd. I've known Glenna for many years. We were both MCC ministers before we were UCC ministers. And uh, we've uh, traveled the world together, literally, taught together in South Africa, sexuality studies. Uh, however, today we're, she comes to us as the pastor of the Decatur United Church of Christ in Decatur, Georgia. And yes, uh, which she was the founding pastor of, I believe, yes, when it was an MCC church, now it's a UCC church. And Glenna, as you'll hear shortly, is an amazing, gifted, dedicated heart teacher who is pastor, preacher, priest, teacher, all of those things combined in one. And so would you welcome to our pulpit here the returning Glenna Shepherd, because I forgot to mention, in 2001 and 2002, she was the director of worship and music here at Cathedral of Hope. So this is a homecoming in every sense as uh, she returns to Cathedral of Hope. We welcome her and welcome her back. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. I love your interim pastor. I hope you do too. He's, you couldn't have found anybody better. Thank you. And thank you, Voices of Hope. This text for today, this Ascension text, is about change. It's not only about change for Jesus, but it's about unimaginable change for human beings, for the church. Today, I also want to congratulate Evan and Casey on your graduation. This time of year, I think, brings back memories for most of us, of us, doesn't it? Memories of our own graduations and our own passage from one stage of life to another. I remember clearly the day my son, Philip, graduated from high school. As he went from one phase of his life to another through this marker in American culture that signals promotion to adulthood, except, of course, for money for college and an occasional load of laundry. Um, <laughs> I watched him grow up. I watched things change right before our eyes. And those of us who are parents and grandparents, aunts and uncles, know well that the view on this side of the graduation stage is different from the view on the other side of the graduation stage because we can see what's coming next. We know about mistakes that they'll surely have to make, the lessons that they will have to learn, the struggles that always accompany the joys of growing up. Just as Philip's life and his role in our family has changed since that day, so has mine, and that's a good thing. As much as I want to protect him and design plans for his life, like that's going to happen, uh, as much as I wanted him to have mature judgment instead of 18-year-old hormones, I knew then that the tasks of living and working and loving became his. I recently traveled to my hometown where I went to high school, to Knoxville, the one in Tennessee, not the one in Texas. Um, and while I was there, I was there for a funeral, and while I was there, I ran into a woman that I had known in high school. Uh, I'll call her Beverly. That's not her name, but I'll call her that. Beverly was three years older than I. And, are you ready? Still lives with her mother. Seriously. Beverly has never left home. She never went away to college. She never took a job in another state. It was surreal having conversation with Beverly and her 90-year-old mother. Because in some ways, it was just really stunning. In some ways, they haven't changed at all. Their relationship hasn't changed. Their roles in relationship to each other, they communicated as if they were, you know, 18 and 40. It was just really, really bizarre. And so I, I wonder, I wonder, Be Beverly was an amazing pianist in high school, and so I asked about, about her music pursuits, and she kind of left that all behind, gave it up, settled into, well, really, she settled into her mother's life. Her mother's friends were her friends. Her mother's church was her church. She was even a member of her mother's bridge club. And so I wonder... Has Beverly become all that she could be if she had been sent from home or had left home to make a life of her own? Now, I certainly would not come to any conclusion about Beverly's contentment in life. 
But it's hard not to make observations or to ask questions. Has Beverly even been able to learn how to make decisions for herself? Has she deferred to her mother as children do? What about relationships, friendships, romantic relationships? Has she clearly differentiated herself and her purpose in life from that of her mother? And the one that I think is probably the most sad, have either Beverly or her mother realized the beauty of that special adult-adult relationship that can happen between a parent and their grown-up, independent children. In a word, I really wonder if Beverly has grown up, if she's stretched into her own destiny, developed her own values and her own mission in life. We've heard this morning the reading of the story of Jesus' ascension. We heard this morning the, the version from Acts. Now, it's really interesting because this is only in one of the Gospels. It's only in the Gospel of Luke. But as you probably know, Luke also wrote the book called The Acts of the Apostles. And he tells the story again there. But it's different. The details are different, which just makes you wonder what that's, what that's kind of all about. This is, at its best, this is an odd story. It's odd to our modern scientific worldview. And so we wonder, I hope we wonder, if ascension might mean something other than go up to the sky. I wonder if something else, something maybe even more profound, more spiritual, more real for the church and for Jesus took place on that day. Some scholars say that this is a story that the church took from the Hebrew scriptures to connect Jesus with the prophets, some of whom also ascended. But it's also a story that is chock full of meaning. For the church, practical meaning, amazing meaning, meaning about change for us even now. We know that Jesus was coming to the close of his post-resurrection time on earth. I imagine that his friends were experiencing a lot of different things. Fear, dread, excitement that he was with them again. Fear that the resurrection might all be a dream. Dread that he would turn around and leave them yet again. But Jesus stays a while with them. He assuages their fears, assures them as he did with Thomas when he said, here, touch and see. Assures them that he is real and present with them. He continues in these days to pass on his wisdom and show them what the realm of God is about. That the realm of God is about love poured out for those on the margins. It's about hope in the face of hopelessness. It's about justice and freedom from all that is not the law of love. And so the time has come. They experience his embodied self yet one more time. And then it happens. The action is brief, very brief. Jesus commissions them. He declares them witnesses and he makes them a promise. He promises them that they will be clothed with power from on high. He blesses them. He withdraws from them and ascends to heaven, leaving them to try to find somewhere in their imagination what God would be like without him, how God would come to them. The ancient story from the Hebrew scriptures that Jesus' ascension recalls, at least most for me, for me, is the story of Elijah and Elisha. I'm sure you remember the story. You remember that Elijah, the prophet, the elderly prophet, was at the end of his life. He was traveling with the younger prophet, his disciple of sorts, Elisha, who was to be his successor. Elijah tried to withdraw from Elisha, tried to be alone at the end of his life, but Elisha would not leave him. Finally, at the banks of the Jordan, Elijah took his mantle, his cloak, and he rolled it up, and he struck the water, and with this action, the water parted so that they could cross over in this act of bold liberation and union with God. The elder Elijah then asked Elisha what he wanted him to do for him before he left the earth. I'm sure you know his reply. Elisha said, 
give me a double portion of your spirit. That spirit that is so united with God and God's purposes in the world. I want that. And so after Elijah ascended in a whirlwind to the heavens, Elisha picked up Elijah's mantle that was left behind. He rolled it up too and invoked God's power. He struck the water, which parted as it had through Elijah. The mantle was passed. The power and presence of God was with Elisha. Word spread that many said that the spirit of Elijah lived on in Elisha. Like Elisha, Jesus has shown his spiritual power, his connection with God to those who followed him. They saw it all. They saw him feed the hungry. They knew how he brought the outcast into the circle of God's grace. They watched as he stepped over, as he transcended barriers of religion and race and gender and age, as he healed and restored, overturned tables when the poor were being exploited. This, all of this, and the power of God that went through him to do all of this was Jesus' spiritual mantle. His manner and touch and the way he attended to people and stood up for those who never dreamt of being treated with dignity. This was Jesus' spiritual mantle, and he had every intention of passing it on. He passed it on so that those who knew him could take up his life, continue to incarnate God on this earth, become the body of Christ, in each new age. With this ascension story, the gospel story, the story of the life of Jesus has come to completion. And the story of the church has just begun. The time was then for the church, for those who had lived alongside Jesus to become the body of Christ in the world. And so in the same way that a parent sends a graduating son or daughter into the world, fragile, bold, zealous, timid, excited, fearful, Jesus anoints this unsure, faltering, and yet transformed people as they become God with us. Jesus had taught them, prepared them, shown them the ways to the realm of God the way of shared power, power to reconcile, to feed and heal, and now he passes to them an inheritance, a spiritual trust with the promise that the spirit that filled Christ would fill them as well. He passes it on so that the world can know this transforming love and abundant life that is new and relevant in every age. In the same way that Beverly's life and relationship with her mother were compromised because the letting go didn't happen. I wonder, would Jesus' remaining with them have kept them and maybe us from being the witnesses that we could be? In the brilliance, brilliance of his light, we may never let our light shine. In the healing of his touch, we may never allow ourselves to channel that spirit and become agents of healing. If Jesus is feeding the hungry, we'd stand in line to be fed rather than offering food to others. I remember hearing an explanation of Jesus' ascension when I was a child. It went something like this. Jesus had to leave or the spirit couldn't come. Well, the person who said this may have meant that somehow Jesus and the Spirit couldn't occupy the same space at the same time. And in that way, this is certainly an inadequate explanation. But perhaps in another way, it's true. If Jesus had somehow remained physically present, the disciples' eyes would remain on him. And they, and we, may not have been able to fully pick up that mantle and receive the measure of the promised spirit. 
They saw God in Jesus. And they may have kept it cloistered there in him, not allowing themselves to become bearers of that same spirit, healers of the sick, those who feed the hungry and give themselves to bring justice. They, we, may not have become people of prayer, preachers of the sacred worth of all people, if we could still look to Jesus to say it right and give his attention to the last and the least. But Jesus does leave. And he does promise that that same spirit will clothe them with power. That baptism with the breath and fire of God would flow through them, in them, utterly drenching them with holiness, that same holiness that they witness in Jesus. And as it does, the word of God becomes flesh once again in the church. They and we are Christed, really. We, the church, become the body of Christ in our age. As our children move to a more independent place in life, we send them into the world, believing in them, believing in their gifts and their abilities and in their heart and their soul, and we assure them of our support and our friendship. But we allow them to grow up confident that their experience and their learning will take them where God wants them to go. In a similar way, Jesus blesses the disciples and us, that is, puts trust in us, and then remains close, confident, confident. Have you ever thought that Jesus could be confident in you? Confident that we can be faithful, vibrant, compelling, witnesses, calling forth God's love and justice in all we do. In Jesus' blessing, he calls us to grow up, to be witnesses and lovers, to be those who give ourselves for the sake of love. Preacher Barbara Lundblad describes an old woodcut print of Jesus' ascension. The print is pretty literal and simple. It portrays an ascending Jesus and the disciples who are right there with their eyes focused towards heaven. But she explains, if you look on the other direction of that print, on the ground that Jesus just left, you'll see his footprints remain on the earth. Perhaps, Dr. Lundblad suggests, the artist simply wanted to add some homey detail. Or, perhaps the footprints are a clue to the legacy that Jesus leaves behind, and that is guidance. He modeled the way for us. A new way to be fully human, united with God, following in the footsteps of Jesus. Oh, my friends, we live in a world, in a nation, that desperately needs those who will take up this new way of being human. We live in a nation where violence often trumps compassion. We live in a time where the 1% not only get richer on, on the backs of the poor, but feel entitled to do so. We can be assured that those footprints that Jesus leaves us will take us to places of suffering and need in our time and commissions us to be the body of Christ for such a time as this. The mantle has been passed. The spirit is promised. The passion is unleashed again as the church becomes the ever new, ever renewing body of Christ. As we see Jesus take that spiritual mantle and give it to us, may we, like Maya Angelou, be eager to say yes. Yes, I'll take it. And we hear her words cheering us on leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. Into daybreak that's wonderfully clear, I rise. 
bringing the gifts my ancestors gave. I rise, I rise, I rise. May it be so, church. Amen.